Um, so lots of kind of variation, really interesting things to talk about. We'll go through the presentations and we'll have a quick panel discussion. And as we go, um, if any of you have questions, if you can please just put those into the chat and we'll um, go through those at the end and do a kind of quick Q&A. Okay, so if we get going and um, Paul. Brilliant, thanks very much. Um, Lucy, I'll just <clears throat> share my screen. And if you could give me a quick nod to make sure that's went through okay, I'll get started. Yeah, all good. Okay, so yes, brilliant to be here. So thanks very much for inviting me along to this. And um, I've got just 10 minutes or so. I'm delighted to see some familiar faces uh, in the audience. And uh, they will pretty much know that it's near impossible for me to meet a, a time deadline, but I'll try my best to sort of stick to the 10 minutes as, as, as much as I can. So as Lucy said, um, yes, my name is Paul Best. I am Program Director for Social Work at Queen's University. I'm a qualified cognitive behavioral therapist, and I lead the immersive technologies and digital mental health network within the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work. And uh, in a previous life, I do have a, a degree within the, the film school at, uh, at Queen's. Um, so um, I like to think I've got, a, uh, I suppose, an interest and a nice perspective across a number of different uh, sort of areas and fields, though primarily my focus now is in health and social care and mental health uh, research. So this is pretty much, this is a quick presentation, okay? There's there's not the time really to go into sufficient depth uh, in this, on, on this field, this fascinating and emerging uh, field and this technology that's, that's sort of just exploded onto the scene in the last few years. So what I want to do is give a snapshot of how virtual reality and immersive 360 video in particular, uh, how this content can be used or, or potentially used uh, to support the treatment uh, of mental health issues and, and, and conditions. And, I, and I'm particularly thinking about uh, you sort of within routine clinical care and within routine clinical uh, settings. So your day-to-day -day access and sort of treatment of, of mental health conditions. Uh, and as we go through the presentation, I'll try and show some early proof of concept work. So we're at the beginning of our, of our journey where we're just starting to create content and develop materials. And uh, I'll share some of our thinking around that. Now, one of the things that I really want to get across in this talk, um, because there is a growing and emerging evidence around the, the, the use of virtual reality to treat mental health conditions, where I think there's potential and where we need to get a bit better is how we make this technology as cost effective as possible. So it gets to as many people as possible. It gets as many, many people as possible. Okay. And that's really where a lot of my focus is. It's on using this content, but also being mindful of the cost implications uh, of it. And I'll hopefully pick up on that a bit as I, as I go through the next uh, few minutes of the talk. So immersive technology uh, field is new and innovative, but it's been around for you know a, a long time, you know, 60, 70 years, people have been experimenting with this type of technology. But what's tend to have happened is that very recently, probably within the, the last five years, uh, we're seeing real advancements in um, sort of the hardware um, and there's now like multiple different sort of headsets available at quite reasonable prices. And we're not even at the point where the headsets don't even need to be tethered uh, to high powered sort of gaming PC units. Um, we've got standalone um, headsets such as the, the Oculus Quest that still allow six degrees of freedom. And I think the most recent Oculus Quest uh, 2 has came out there a few weeks ago, uh, priced at around £300. So, uh, we're seeing advancements in the technology uh, and, and, and the quality and how it, uh, I suppose, um, it makes a better all-round immersive experience, but we're also seeing the price point coming down, uh, which makes it, um, I suppose, more applicable uh, to the things that I want to use it for, it makes it more relevant uh, to, to the work that I'm interested in. So cost is a, is a big factor uh, in this world. You know, the how virtual reality and how immersive technology can be used to support mental health um, is a long sort of talk in itself. I mean, there's books devoted to this issue, but I'm just going to pick up on three things that are particularly important for me and the work I'm interested in. So the first thing is, is virtual reality um, exposure therapy um, has shown within a number of studies already um, to be particularly useful for the treatment of phobia and anxiety-based disorders. Okay, so 
you know, at a simplest level, if you're in an experience, if you're in a virtual environment or a 360 environment and it, and you think it's real, then there's potential usefulness there for exposure-based treatment, okay? The second um, part of where it might be useful is actually this technology, and I'm thinking particularly of my role as program director for social work, is that the technology can help us to develop more nuanced and sophisticated approaches to the training of mental health practitioners. Certainly um, on the social work program, um, while we have various um, different uh, classroom-based activities, we can do role plays, different kind of presentations, panel discussions, uh, there's no substitute for real life, okay? And while our course is split between classroom-based teaching and uh, sort of in-person real life experience, um, the more that we can bring the outside world into the classroom, uh, the better. Plus, we also need to develop certain scenarios in which students can experiment with failure and feel what it's like uh, to fail. And there's there's um, there's real opportunities here to develop scenarios in which we can immerse the student. And again, it goes back to this idea, if you, if you think it's real, okay, then it's a better learning experience, or certainly that's our hypothesis, because we want to challenge you to make decisions when you are sort of feeling it emotionally, when you feel intimidated in the scene, or there's a lot of stuff going on. And virtual reality can really help us to develop our students in this way, to make them more prepared when they go out into practice. So there's a real indirect benefit on mental health uh, through um, developing sort of more sophisticated training programs using immersive technologies. And the last one is that one of the kind of inherent features, if you like, of virtual reality um, technology in particular is this the, the idea that we can customize it um, and we can also create environments that might be difficult to sort of recreate in real life or visit in real life. And this is particularly important when we discuss disorders such as post-traumatic stress, um, particularly because there's such a bespoke element to it. Um, individuals who um, suffer from this uh, condition or have been diagnosed with this condition um, you know, tend to experience a traumatic event in certain unique ways. Uh, even people who are in the exact same environment are, are exposed to the exact same trauma. And therefore, we need that level of customization in order to make that, uh, that, that scenario kind of fit as best and, and, and uh, really help us unlock treatment for those individuals. So just to kind of give examples of how this might work, okay, um, I'm going to play some videos and just talk over them. So this is just a screen grab from a commercial uh, virtual reality experience called uh, Ritchie's Plank. So some of you who have, uh, you know, used uh, virtual reality, um, you know, platforms or be regular will, will know of this or have heard of this experience, okay? And it's uh, very much set up as like a party uh, game and uh, where you have to walk uh, out of this lift and walk across this, uh, this plank. And um, it costs about 14 pounds. And for those of you who have put the headset on, you know, the visuals are very good and there's great use of audio to really immerse you in this environment. Now, as someone who doesn't have a fear of heights, I find this incredibly difficult to do the first uh, couple of times. Uh, how would this translate into treatment or how could it be adapted for use within, uh, you know, therapeutic care? Well, if you take one of the ways, probably the most uh, popular way, if you will, for treating a phobia, uh, what we would do is a graded exposure approach okay so essentially you would put the person in a situation where they're exposed to something that they fear their anxiety levels will shoot up you wait for it to come back down and then you'll gradually gradually uh, increase the intensity of that exposure okay until they've you know i suppose properly faced up to what they were sort of scared about and that's that's kind of the very sim simplistic kind of behavioralist approach to treating phobias so taking this, um, this scenario, and again, this is commercially available. This isn't something that we've developed uh, or it hasn't been developed uh, to, to treat acrophobia. You would take this first step of the elevator door open. And so someone who has a fear of heights, anxiety levels might go up to 10 out of 10. Letting them sit here for a period of time or stand here and take it in this environment. Eventually the body will have to shut off that kind of fight or flight mechanism to save resources. And once they come down and they're reporting that their anxiety level is about five out of 10, you would ask them then to maybe take a step onto the, onto the plank and then their anxiety would shoot back up again. You'd wait for it to come back down and then repeat the process until they've walked the, the, the full length of the plank. Why is that important and why would that be useful in terms of treatment? Well, certainly it does mean that um, you can treat conditions because if they feel that it's real, 
Okay, if the person feels it's real, they are facing up to their fear. You can treat it in um, sort of like a one space in a therapeutic room. So it increases sort of access uh, the service or the, the sort of uh, this exposure content. You don't have to go out and look for it. There also might be an initial reluctance for a person to go and face up to something that they're scared of. And therefore, virtual reality is perhaps an easier way of getting people to agree to do it. And what you might also find is this is quite an intense, exaggerated example of, um, you know, you would never put someone in a situation in real life. But you might find that when someone conquers this, that they might be um, actually have very little issues with going up a, a, a lift or maybe going to um, like a shopping mall and going up the tiers because they've managed to con conquer such an extreme example. So this stands out for me as very important because it's something that exists already uh, and we're just taking it and trying to see whether it can be adapted for use within therapeutic practice. So there's very little cost implica uh, implications from that. This is a study by colleagues in, in Oxford VR who actually developed their own program for treating uh, uh, acrophobia. Now, um, it's worth noting they didn't use an exposure-based approach. It was something a bit more complex, but they had really good results using virtual reality to treat this condition. Um, I suppose the point I'm making is, though, that there's more of a cost outlay because they had to create their own bespoke program to do that, where there might be some commercially available or even freely available content there that could be adapted. The next one is um, training scenario um, using... Uh, three uh, immersive 360 video. So I really like this technology because, again, it can be uploaded on the headset. Uh, it can give you a sense of being present in the space. In this scenario, we have a therapeutic setting and uh, the practitioners um, listening these sort of key um, behaviors and thoughts and emotions and feelings from the, from the client. And as a student, you can sit on the shoulder of the therapist, if you like, and really get in a sense of, um, you know, what are the key questions they ask? What are the sort of gesture-based and nonverbal-based communication? What does it feel like to be in this room? To better prepare the student when they get out to practice. And one of the key um, sort of benefits of this is that it's cheap. You have a 360 camera and you can create this environment, okay? You don't need to virtually reconstruct an environment in which to do that. So it's far more accessible for say someone like myself who uh, can't like generate these virtual reality programs uh, or environments because they don't have the skills or the knowledge to do that. One of the major drawbacks, however, of this is that you are static. You're in a fixed position. So your interaction within the scene is limited. You can move your head to interact with it, but you can't walk around and see different perspectives. The next one that I just kind of want to round it off with <laughs> is talking about how virtual reality offers us the ability to create environments that perhaps you wouldn't be able to uh, go back and experience in real life or that you can customize within the space. Okay. Now I want to be quite, I was looking for an example uh, that I could, um, that I could show here. Um, and they are quite expensive to sort of build. So I've asked the company that we work with to do a quick mock-up for us to, to give an example. This isn't something that we're using necessarily, but just to give an example of how it might work. So we took an, an incident from Northern Ireland's past of the, of the Shankill bomb. Now, I want to be sensitive about this because this is a, 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 something that happened well near 30 years ago. The impact of that is still, is still felt today. Okay, But what I've asked is the company called ProPeer Solutions to um, develop a virtual reality kind of mock-up of of this, um, of the aftermath, and these pictures of the archive footage are very famous, and certainly in the local context would be um, very recognizable to people. Uh, and Propia came up with this very quickly, so it's not you know, a complete scenario. But just to give an example of how virtual reality can be used to develop um, you know, these spaces that we can't visit and can't go back to. Now, why is that important? Well, when it comes to treating trauma, um, some of the, the, the features that, that stand out for me are that well, one of the main thing is, regardless of the protocol you're using, the will invariably involve some sort of exposure to the trauma memory. Okay, so you have to go back and open up the memory in order to treat the condition. Um, now, for a lot of people, most people, in fact, they don't want to do that because they want to get rid of the memory and they're trying their best to get rid of it. And for other people, they've buried it so deep that they find it very difficult uh, to kind of access it. Virtual reality um, could be quite useful then for those groups because the first group they found in some studies, particularly uh, with Skip Rizzo and colleagues on military PTSD, that it's more acceptable for them to go back into a virtual reality simulation uh, rather than to 
revisit uh, the actual site of the trauma. Um, the second thing was is, is because of the visual imagery coupled with um, uh, immersive audio can actually allow people who struggle to get into the, the trauma memory can really facilitate them opening up that memory, which is a really, really fundamental part of treatment. However, and I've just shown the clip here, as you see the video uh, of the car moving, that was just to demonstrate that what we can also do, and this is the customization uh, available in VR, because the experience is, is different for so many people. And because to be honest, a lot of the traumas and PTSD that come through won't be historical based stuff. Uh, there might be car accidents, assaults, robberies, you know, very sort of like uh, location specific events uh, <coughs> that, you don't have pictures of or you know of what, what the crisis looked like that you might actually want to encourage the individual to help recreate the scene itself so the virtual environment might be the road and they might bring in the cars they might bring in the smoke they might bring bring in uh, the people in the environment and help you generate the space in which you can do that reliving or exposure based uh, work with them the downside of course to this is this costs a lot of money uh, to do and whether it's actually feasible and cost effective for everyone who comes in with their own unique trauma journey and experience to create a virtual environment uh, or to replicate you know, their own experience. I think that's one of the main barriers that stops this being implemented within routine clinical care. And just to finish it off, then what we're trying to do and what some of our proof of concept work is how can we get the both best of both worlds? How can we um, take the real images provided through 360 video or just 360 imagery and then combine it with the customization and the interactive qualities of virtual reality um, to create something that's interactive, but is also low cost. So I just asked uh, the company that we're working with, Probe here, to do a quick example. So this is, a, this is a picture that was taken in Belfast on the weekend of a sports betting shop. It was taken on an iPhone. And what they've done here is they've uploaded basically the 2D image into a 3D space. Okay, so if we see if we compare it with the, the virtual reality images on the other side of the road, this has far more uh, detail and looks far more uh, realistic. Um, so we get the benefits of those real images, but we get the interactive uh, quality that comes with the 3D environment. Um, and we think that this might be a really interesting sort of combination of technologies that might be very uh, useful when it comes to therapy, particularly uh, for some disorders that are a bit more complex and require a more uh, bespoke and nuanced approach. So that's me, Lucy. I hope I haven't taken over too much time. Um, that's great, lovely. Thank you very much, Paul. We've got over about, and I think we've got, I think we've got a bit of flexibility with time. That was brilliant, very, right? very interesting. Thank you, um, Sarah. Uh, if you want to go up next. Sure thing. Cool. Hi there, everyone. Let me just um, get my screen up and running. Um, there we go. Can you see this all right? Cool. The si by the silence, uh, I'm going to assume yes. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Tico. Uh, I uh, wear quite a few hats, I guess. So I'm a bit of a cheerleader, I guess, when it comes to the world of uh, VR and mental health um, and, and I guess healthcare more broadly. Uh, so I'm the founder of uh, my own organisation, Hatsumi, which means uh, to see something for the first time. And, uh, and I'll talk here a bit about um, what we're doing in terms of uh, looking at how people can visualize lived experience of um, pain and emotion using 3D drawing and VR, uh, as well as uh, my other work on Explore Deep, which is a, a breath controlled uh, VR experience. Um, and then alongside that also, um, I'm very enthusiastic about how we can, I guess, get everyone working together and really thinking about um, what the future of VR in healthcare could, could look like. Um, so as a little bit more background, I had did not expect at all to end up working in, in VR and health. Um, I, when I was younger at university, I studied anthropology um, and then uh, worked very briefly in the NHS um, before uh, end up moving into the contemporary arts. And so um, it was around uh, this time in 2013 that um, my dad passed away. Uh, in fact, eight years ago today, in fact, which is strange to think how much time has actually passed. But, um, but I think, you know, going through the grieving process, um, it 
it really brings up a lot of questions that I had never really considered before and felt very lost in terms of like what I wanted to do with my life and and uh, sort of where I sat in the world and uh, I got invited to uh, uh, volunteer uh, as part of this exhibition uh, a gallery down here in Brighton where I live um, called Fabrica and so this is a really incredible installation called The Blue Root by uh, an artist called Karina Kai Konan um, and all of these shirts were contributed by uh, volunteers um, and so I think mine's just in the top left hand corner and uh, and it was really about you know people sort of coming together and creating something new out of um, the sense of, of things that, that were lost and, uh, and I remember standing in the gallery sort of invigilating it and just being able to talk to people about what this meant and uh, for me I, I, I never really engaged in the arts before that I always thought it was something for this sort of cultural elite and, and that was not the, a party that I was invited to but I think standing there and having conversations with people about their own life experiences and realising that the arts is such a, an amazing tool as a, a sort of catalyst for conversation uh, and getting people to um, yeah, sort of share stories and and really think about the world uh, in different ways. And and naturally, the arts is um, such a, an incredible tool for for well being. And I know lots of us are really enthusiastic to talk more later on about uh, the role of arts in health. Um, but skip forward a few years, and I ended up becoming, uh, I guess, quite mentally unwell. Um, they never totally were sure exactly what happened to me, but the form that I was given uh, said that I was uh, diagnosed with um, psychosis uh, or a mania with um, psychotic um, psychotic symptoms and I just remember going through the healthcare system and just feeling like very lost and not really knowing how to articulate myself or really explain what I was going through um I just didn't really have have the, the words in me and I think especially sitting in a in a consultant's office and then being like well what happened it's like well a, a lot of stuff has happened and, uh, and we have a very short amount of time to to discuss that um, apparently on average you have about 11 seconds to convey your condition to a doctor before you're, you'll probably be interrupted and uh, and so I became really interested in how especially we can use um, technology and storytelling to understand uh, different forms of lived experience and that's when I first started getting really interested in VR because I thought that uh, especially for things like psychosis I thought VR was a really interesting metaphor for um, kind of living in these two very different realities and, and trying to sort of engage in both of them which can be uh, quite stressful and confusing uh, but also incredibly fascinating um, and so that sort of led led down this garden path of exploring um, VR uh, initially as a storytelling tool but then also realizing that it can be used in this multitude of ways to improve um, health and well-being um, this is a really great project uh, that came out a few years ago called A Machine to Be Another by Be Another Lab. And this is a sort of body swapping experience. So one person has a camera uh, attached to their head and then the other person and then that image is being sort of live streamed into the other person's headset. And then you can start to mirror each other's movements. And, uh, and I think that's a really fascinating way of sort of experiencing the world through somebody else's eyes um, and being able to feel like you are embodied in someone else. And they did some really interesting research about uh, how that can uh, reduce sort of uh, a bias against like people with different gender or, or racial bias. And, and what's kind of started as an interesting art project ended up having these really interesting applications in, um, in sort of empathy and understanding. Um, so skipping forward a little bit further, I, I, I uh, moved to Australia for a little bit and when I was out there I worked uh, on something called the Big Anxiety Festival, which was uh, an arts and mental health festival um, based at the University of New South Wales in Australia. And, uh, and it was there I met a really fascinating researcher who was collaborating with the festival called um, Dr. Catherine Boydell. And she introduced me to this fascinating research method called body mapping or body map storytelling. And so traditionally you sort of trace around your body on this large piece of paper, you go through a mindfulness experience and you start to think about uh, different different sort of forms of experience. So for example, what does like anxiety feel like in my body? Like where do I physically feel anxious? Like is it a sort of you know churning in your stomach or you know does your throat feel tight? Uh, and sort of using uh, visual symbols to be able to uh, illustrate that and thinking about you know the colors, the textures or the words. 
and uh, and I think having worked for, for some time uh, by that point as more of a sort of arts administrator, uh, I definitely never saw myself as an artist and became very frustrated by my own inability to sort of put it onto a, a piece of paper. And so I guess this was uh, the birth of, um, of Hatsumi. Uh, I was thinking, you know, how could we connect this with virtual reality? I was really fascinated by uh, existing 3D drawing experiences like Tilt Brush uh, made by Google, uh, which is a sort of 3D drawing experience. And, uh, and so over the last few years, um, initially applying for this as a PhD and then ended up kind of developing into an art project, company, research project, whatever I am now. I've uh, been working with, with people with lived experience, specifically of chronic pain for now, but I want to expand it more into other conditions to, uh, to develop this sort of virtual reality tool um, that enables people to uh, visualize uh, the embodied experience of both pain and emotion uh, using sort of 3D drawing. So, uh, so here are some some uh, sort of in uh, images that that we've created so far. So, we've been creating all these different 3D drawing tools. Uh, so you can draw both in uh, inside the body, out uh, on the skin, and outside the body as well. Um, and so we've been testing this in um, different sort of clinical settings, uh, thinking about like patients being able to do this in, for example, waiting rooms, uh, so they can create their illustration and then take that into the consultation room and, uh, and show their clinician how they're feeling. And, uh, and I think what, what I'm very enthusiastic about this is that it, it's enabling people to realize that, that medical conditions and, and mental health experiences and emotions um, aren't distinct, like they, they come together and ultimately influence each other. And uh, we found that it's really enabled people to have a bit more of a holistic discussion about, you know, what's going on in their lives, like why are they feeling so anxious, like how is that, that, that experience of chronic pain um, and really influencing it as well. And so we've been applying this as a tool to uh, improve that patient doctor communication, um, but also how you can uh, share that with other family members as well that may not understand because, you know, all these experiences are sort of invisible, right? And it, again, it's very difficult to, um, to articulate that. Um, in some uh, development that we've been doing as well recently, we've been looking at how we can save them so people can create whole sort of journals uh, of, of illustrations so you can sort of map how you're feeling in your body day to day. Um, and, uh, and we've actually been uh, integrating sort of some AI analytics into it as well and starting to think about well, what happens if we have um, you know, 500 people with, with fibromyalgia, for example, illustrating their pain or, or you know, a thousand people illustrating depression. Uh, and how do people maybe vary or, or what sort of similarities do they have um, in, in how they might express their, their, their experience? And how might that vary based on, on age or cultural background or, or language as well? And we're starting to already like observe trends in how people are visualizing that and, um, and maybe interested in seeing how that can like further support um, the sort of diagnostic process. Um, and then finally, you know, the fact that this is a sort of artistic output, right? Then, um, then I'm really enthusiastic about using this as a tool for um, sort of public engagement and being able to do sort of public exhibitions where we can create terracotta armies of, of illustrations of lived experience. And again, just having these, these conversations um, about how uh, we understand pain and, and mental health and, and just the fact that it's so unbelievably common, but you know, this classic uh, thing that we all just like try and hide it or just don't want to talk about it. But, um, but I think creating these sort of new forms of of empathy and understanding and I guess trying to find this like halfway between you know this more qualitative storytelling that, that's really required and things like paper body mapping that um that is really showing things on one side but um uh but, uh, you know, having huge chunks of paper and pens in your doctor's office isn't necessarily ideal. But then obviously doctors as well, going back to the sort of doctor patient communication issue as well, like they need to be able to measure things as well. And so we're looking at pain because it's such a... Um, it's so problematic, I find, in how uh, pain surveys are currently conducted, that you're asking people to essentially say on a scale of one to 10, uh, where they're feeling their pain. And so this is where, by digitizing it and putting it in VR, we can hopefully make it a bit more accessible in the access to drawing tools, making it easier for, for people to create their illustrations. But again, also being able to um, kind of uh, have this more quantitative uh, analytic side to it as well. 
Um, just to segue into uh, another um, project I'm involved in um, that I really love talking about, because again, I think it's a really beautiful example of sort of art science collaborations. Uh, it's a project called Deep. Uh, so Deep is a meditative virtual reality game controlled by breathing. And so um, I find that the majority of VR healthcare applications out there uh, are often created by healthcare professionals and academics. And this is very much an artist led project that has um, by Owen Harris and Nikki Smith, uh, who've worked closely in collaboration with the, the Games for Emotional and Mental Health Lab um, for about five years now. And so this is a really beautiful experience that, um, that I really enjoy being a producer on where um, you have, um, you move through this beautiful underwater world sort of controlled by your breathing. And so you see your breath visualized in front of you as this sort of circle that moves in and out, but also the world is responding um, to your breath as well. And, um, and so you can kind of see here one sort of part of it, of an example of how the world is, is responding to your breath. And, uh, and so initially they, we've created um, a sort of biofeedback belt. And so you put that around your diaphragm and it's measuring your diaphragmic movement that sort of helps you, you move through the world. And I love it because it's been taken to, you know, film festivals, it's gone to like Tribeca, Tribeca and South by Southwest, but also, you know, we've taken it to hospitals and we've started to really generate um, a really sort of a strong clinical um, sort of uh, evidence base behind it as well. Um, and through our partners at the Games for Emotional and Mental Health Lab. Um, and so we're now starting to take it into uh, yeah, various hospitals across the, the UK and the Netherlands and also in the US as well. Um, and we've also got a permanent installation at the Nemo Science Museum in the Netherlands. So this is uh, an example of it just in the top left uh, as well. And so with that, we've made a sort of uh, non-VR version where you sit in this chair and, uh, and it's got the belt around you. And uh, it's been fun seeing people sort of playfully hack the experience uh, and, and you can see there these two friends that are, are trying to breathe in tandem together to sort of control the game. Uh, and so for those researchers that, um, that are interested, then here are some of the um, uh, publications we've done so far, but it's been really interesting sort of being able to conduct these um, different experimental studies to see how it can really support uh, specifically anxious youths. Um, we've also done some research looking at how it can help to reduce um, uh, anxiety and disruptive classroom behavior in, um, in young people with complex needs. Um, and, and I think another thing that I really like about it is that it's quite accessible. You just need to be able to breathe and and look in a direction, but, um, which makes it, it very easy to show it to a, a range of audiences. Um, and, and again, I'm really excited by its uh, ability to be applied to uh, a variety of conditions, uh, kind of in the same way of, as Hatsumi as well, that it's uh, things like mindfulness, I guess, are, are useful in, in a variety of contexts. So um, we are now uh, doing some research with um, a center in the US looking at how it can support people with um, young people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we've been working with a hospital in Vienna as well, looking at how it can be used in uh, lung rehabilitation. And we're um, kind of looking at how it can help people uh, in the recovery from COVID as well. Um, and then I guess just to sort of summarize and look at the, the, the bigger picture of, of why I'm so enthusiastic about of VR and health, those are the two projects that I guess I'm like deeply involved in the sort of development and research of, but, um, but in my other role then, roles, whatever they are now, then, um, then looking about like, how does all of this connect? Because when I was first looking at uh, starting Hatsumi, then I was looking at um, speaking to other like VR healthcare founders and being like, what, what does this mean? How does everyone work together? And, and I think for a long time, it's been very fragmented. And, and through these conversations, it's been really interesting to see like the huge variety of ways that, that VR is used in healthcare. Um, and actually mental health is a, is a really big part of it, as Paul obviously mentioned before. Um, and again, how it can be used in patient education, soothing people's anxiety and what's going to happen when they get to the hospital or what a procedure might be like. Uh, training clinicians, uh, it's a really incredible uh, pain management tool. Um, and again, like using it in physiotherapy as well, getting people to like be motivated to, to do those certain exercises and, and movements. And naturally that can really um, improve mental health as, as well. Um, and so I think it's important to be, to be able to think into how this sort of connects into a, a bigger picture, because I think there needs to be a, a quite a large bit of investment into sort of connecting um, all of the dots. And I was trying to think of a way of, of being able to convey just how many 
fascinating organizations and people are involved and we really just need to create a, an ecosystem ideally where we can all start talking to each other from like the sort of charities and, and research organizations uh places um like Nesta that have been doing some really incredible work to support um, art science collaborations to create VR interventions for mental health. But also how do we work with um, organizations like Oculus that are, you know, are kind of leading the game in terms of uh, hardware and software development, but uh, perhaps their approaches to cybersecurity, especially at the moment are quite challenging. Um, but there's lots of, you know, really great organizations out there, but it's just, you know, how do we connect all of these uh, hardware and software companies? How do they work with artists and creatives? How do we, uh, you know, find a sort of way that um, there can be a framework for uh, developing VR for mental health um, and beyond as well? So, um, so I'm really um, very much a, a supporter of, of, of getting people in the room and, and thinking about things from a, from a big perspective, but also uh, a larger perspective, but also, you know, working on the ground and, and, and finding ways of being able to have a solid evidence base behind um, what we're doing as well. And, uh, and through the work that we've been doing the last few years, we've been running a series of roundtables to really look at how we, we are able to um, manage that and from issues from distribution of, of VR experiences and how we get it to be potentially adopted on on mass and safely how do we support this sort of uh, cross cross cultural cross cultural um, cross sector collaboration between artists and universities uh, developing that underpinning uh, infrastructure uh, and also making sure that we have a real diversity of people involved as well I think is really important and making sure that we involve uh, patients uh, in the design of those experiences as well. Um, this image in the top left uh, is uh, of uh, a really incredible woman called Kay Smith who um, is uh, currently in palliative care and has been using VR to um, manage her pain and, and has, has been a real sort of uh, yeah, voice for uh, involving patients in the development of VR experiences. And so ultimately I'm, I'm really excited about a future where we do work together and, um, and there's there's lots of discussions now about how we can actually have a, a VR strategy within the NHS um, as well. And, um, and I'm really excited for, for thinking about how we can all hopefully work together in the future to achieve that. Um, so I have I've not gone on to, for too long. Um, thank you so much for um, letting me share a little bit about my interests and what I've been up to. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was wonderful. Um, so, Hannah, we can hear from you next. Yes. Um, great to hear uh, about your work, Sarah, in more detail. And um, I'm going to come in here at the very different uh, end, in a sense, because I'm very much early on in a project where uh, I'm coming from an artistic background and seeing how I can uh, develop some of and taking my skills from the uh, world of theatre and performance into uh, this world of arts and health and immersive uh, work. So uh, as Lucy said, I'm currently doing a uh, a uh, practice-based PhD at Queen's um, and I'm looking uh, to in the area of immersive audio for people living with Parkinson's and my project is in development with uh, people with Parkinson's uh, a, a bit uh, challenged at the moment during co uh, Covid but we're getting there um, um, so as I said I've got 20 years uh, of experience, uh, 20 plus actually, uh, uh, working as a, a dramaturg, um, developing professional productions with writers, actors, directors and choreographers for live performance. And now I'm trying to look at how to translate those skills into a digital and immersive um, world. So the uh, some of the projects, and I'll, I'll uh, return to them in a second, uh, I've been working with previously was with immersive audio. Um, and I've seen how, uh, what an incredible visceral impact just the audio uh, have on an audience. Uh, another inspiration to my project was to see the amazing impact for uh, people with Parkinson's of the whole Dance for Parkinson's project. Uh, because I suppose uh, Parkinson's is not a mental health area. It's sort of the, what I'm looking at is the physical connection uh, between our minds and bodies. So and, um, uh, how, how can we through artistic ways uh, uh, enhance that? Um, so 
in my PhD project, then I'm looking at both how we adapt our uh, storytelling tools and skills uh, from theater, uh, which is a three dimensional medium into digital immersive and VR project. Um, and in particular, then focusing now at how to translate that into arts and health, which is again, different from um, what I've done before. Um, and so, as Lucy was mentioned, some of these sort of sound ideas uh, I've been developing for the Parkinson's project is I've also looked at for uh, the mental abuse uh, matter VR project. Um, so I suppose my project is not about visuals because what I'm um, looking at is um, a, a project that is that you can easily use at home. So when we talk about um, or my talk about social prescription later, I'm sort of hoping that this can be something that is very easily um, uh, picked up on in your own time and because you want to not necessarily as a, um, a sort of a treatment routine, but it has uh, the, the underlying ideas is about uh, building skills and rehabilitation. Um, uh, the, um, in most story-based immersive experience, is, um, the participants are invited to inhabit someone else's body and world. However, when I've been working with um, this project, it becomes clear that as in arts and health, you as a participant, you, you step into an, uh, the experience as yourself. So I think that puts a very different onus on us who are creating them uh, about how we how we shape that immersive experience to support a sense of subjective and embodied self. So I'm going to share with you um, now my um, um, presentation here. So uh, as I mentioned, I um, about 10 years ago, I worked, uh, I was part of a creative team who worked on Reassemble Slightly Askew, which is an immersive audio and performance work using binaural sounds. Um, so in, in this piece, you as an audience are uh, inhabiting the body of Shannon, who is also the writer of the piece, whilst she is experiencing an acute brain infection. And through the sound design and the soundscape and the story, we are going on a journey with, within her body through uh, falling unconscious, then surgery, and then a long road to recovery. And the piece was both presented as an artistic experience, but it's also been used for training medical and social care staff all across the world. Um, and it's, it's a truly immersive three-dimensional experience, which affected a lot of audiences really deeply. Um, and here you can see that the, the audience is blindfolded and with headphones, but there is also a really strong performative and embodied experience in that you as an audience is met by a nurse who helps you, you fill in a form and, and you're placed into a hospital bed. So your experience, your physical experience is merged with Shannon's uh, story um, in the first person. So in my project, I'm trying to take a step further by addressing the participants as themselves. So I'm focusing on how language, imagery and sound work together to mold their point of view their perspective and their sense of subjectivity and sensory engagement. So that is, I'm focusing on their mental imagery, uh, what we are creating in our mind's eye, rather than providing visuals. So for me, and this is not to be, um, uh, this is not a mindfulness thing. What what the, my project is asking of the participant is, is quite, intense sort of work with their mental imagery. Um, in recent Parkinson's research, they have also explored mental imagery as part of a rehabilitation tool addressing um, motor issues, um, particularly around the freezing gait and tremors. Um, and it does so by giving the person specific motor imagery instructions uh, to try to enhance their, the patient's uh, motor imagery and how it's connected to their mov movement. So that was the starting point 
of my my project oops oops hang on i'm gonna i've missed one of my slides so yes yeah, so here you can see so it's using um uh sensory lots of different sensory uh and proprioceptive and interoceptive uh, instructions that is given to the narrators in the in the audio to the person with Parkinson's. Um, so I'm creating um, an imaginary world. So here's my sonic world that I'm creating through the immersive audio um, for the the person to inhabit, and they are sort of co-created in their own mind in their own mind's eye. So, and, with, and within this world, a story unfolds. And within that story, I then build in the motor imagery instructions and the first and helping them build up this first person point of view with sensory and motor information. So that sort of sprinkles through the narratives. Um, uh, and so we have here like, and, and then that is enhanced by the sound design. So you have external um, spatialized sound within an ambisonic or binaurally recorded ambience. Um, then we have particularly it's important any kind of movement so for example if we're focusing on the walking that the walk this footsteps uh, which is a real uh, uh, strong cue for people with parkinson's um so the sound of footsteps are then at the right distance from the ears uh, which creates a, a connection for the mind uh, any voices, I have placed any kind of thing that is internal to the person I'm placing in the middle of the head and any other voices are on the outside. And then the thing that I'm uh, exploring uh, now with the interceptive sound design and how to try to place that uh, sort of lower down in the experience body, uh, it's in the ex in experiencing body. Um, and I'm trying to, together with the text, this interoceptive sound design is just helping uh, people to draw attention a bit like what Sarah was talking about is how do you feel and uh, uh, where do you feel it? So it's about, for, for me, it's about the phys physical movement, obviously, because I'm dealing with the physical um, uh, obstructions and then, but also emotional and also neurological. You can add, you know the, the the creativity there can go in um is endless so but it is uh, f focusing the attention and providing a detailed uh, support for creating the um the imagery um so i wanted to uh, this is really artificial <laughs> i have a little presentation um as i said i'm mainly doing immersive audio in my own work but with some imagery but this here i'm going to try to sh show you what i'm doing but mainly with imagery and me reading. So it'll be a bit weird, but stay with me. I hope it'll, um, you, it'll make sense. Um, so let's make this big. Um, so basically imagine that you are the participant and you are seated comfortably with headphones on and you're encouraged to close your eyes and the soundscape transports you to a forest. The narration helps you to create the world around you, how it feels, the smells, the temperature, the touch, and what it looks like. You create it. You hear footsteps as if they're from your own body, as if you're walking through a forest. And the description then helps you to imagine that you're walking along a path in a forest towards a lake. You feel the autumn chill in the air it nips the tip of your nose on the way down into your lungs where it enters every little elastic alveoli sac and you can feel the chest expand. The oxygen freely given by the trees is released into your bloodstream. As you walk, you notice details along the side of the path, a colony of mushrooms gathering at the foot of a tree. You stop to study the rings of a fallen tree bearing witness to the seasons and time past. So at this point, your footstep, the sound design or the footstep would have stopped so that um, you are standing still in the audio. So down at the feet, the scattering of yellow leaves stand out sharply from the gray path and your ears tune into the gentle sound as they hit the grounds at the end of their long journey from above the tree crowns 
and you look upwards. It's dizzying looking straight up. You feel your body adjusting and steadying after this move. There is so much space above you. The tallness of the trees and the tallness of you, your muscles and skeleton holding you up. Meanwhile, this moment is imprinting into your mind as a memory. You leave the tree crowns and focus on the bench in front of you by the video. So you start walking and as you walk, you focus on each step, the heel touching the ground and the front of the foot pushing you forward, building momentum. This is your walking rhythm. As you keep walking, you feel the arms swing in opposite direction to your legs and you feel the skeleton move smoothly, adjusting to the pace. You stop and look straight ahead towards the bench. So many memories at that bench and so on and so on. So as you see, these are the, um, the proprioceptive and the interoceptive and sensory instructions which um, I build into the stories. Um, and so the person can practice the uh, mental imagery, I'm trying to do it with precision so they can build up more and more detail. Um, and it should be something that is pleasurable, relaxing. And then I'm, as I said, I'm also building in a story into which they are the protagonist. So hopefully there is extra motivation to stay with the experience and to continue to create the mental imagery and to engage your, your um, physical body. So um, yeah, that, that is my project. Great, Anna, thank you very much. Thanks everyone, that was great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna briefly, very briefly talk about mine. I think we will go over, if that's okay with everyone, we'll just kind of, cause I do want to make sure we have a chat and have a chance for questions as well. Um, so I'm gonna race through mine. Um, some of you will already be familiar with my project. Um, anyway, so um, let me just share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Lucy. Yep, great, thank you. Okay, so I just realized that I didn't actually introduce myself. So this is me. Um, I am currently a, a film practice lecturer at Queen's. Um, my background is very much in industry as a um, producer, producer director, uh, exec. Um, and running production companies. So I previously had a company called Mandrake. I've now started a couple of um, companies here, uh, Darkly Films and uh, a, a campaigning charity organization called Mental Abuse Matters. And those two um, entities are kind of doing a, a co-production project, which is my virtual reality project, um, which then ties into uh, my PhD. So, um, that is a, a practice PhD in the film studies department at Queen's. Um, so this is something I was required to do coming in from an industry background in order to kind of get that, um, get past my probation and get my uh, permanent lecturer position. So, I mean, it's great for me. It's a great opportunity for me to do um, something really interesting and innovative. And so um, I had a really good think about what I, what I wanted to do for my PhD. Um, and so this one that I'm doing is, is, is a collaboration with, with Hannah, who you just heard from um, at SARC, also kind of feeding into psychology and, and social work. Uh, so I hope that it will be very much a kind of uh, cross-disciplinary um, project. Um, so it originated from um, a charity, that, the charity that I established and a kind of awareness raising campaign for which I produced an animated film. I'll show you a very quick clip um, of that. Um, You don't know me, and for a long time, I no longer knew myself. 
constantly questioning, unsure about decisions, a sick feeling in my belly, feeling guilty for no reason. I don't know if the audio was on with that or not, but anyway, that gives you an idea of, that was an animated film with anonymous first person testimony of an emotionally abusive, intimate relationship. Um, so from that um, came the idea that for my PhD, I would develop this further in an area that I was really fascinated by, which is um, cinematic VR. So live action VR, as opposed to using animation um, and first person embodied VR, which is really, really fascinating to me and something that Hannah was talking about there. So th this is an experience where you as the user with the headset on are experiencing first person what's happening in this world. Um, and it struck me that if you are trying to talk about um, a very subtle, um, visceral experience like emotional abuse, then this is the best way to do that, to actually make the user feel what the victim is feeling in terms of emotions in the body. Um, so what I hope to do with this project is an actual series of live action VR experiences covering different kinds of emotional abuse. So for example, the first one, pilot project, um, is looking at intimate partner abuse, but I am interested in next looking at um, parental alienation, for example, um, you know, familial parent-child abuse, that sort of thing. Um, uh, really because it's something that I think, um, uh, as both Sarah and Paul were talking about, it, it's difficult to articulate, it's difficult for people who are experiencing it to, to, to articulate. So my goal was really to try and get the visceral experience across in, um, in a very vivid kind of way. Um, so we had our, we filmed our pilot project a uh, week before last, which was um, somewhat of a challenge in COVID time. So we're all masked up there. Um, and we collaborated with Rhett and I, who were fantastic, a VR production company here in Belfast, doing um, lots of fantastic, interesting, innovative stuff in VR. Um, and so we've done the kind of filming bit of that, just to sort of show you what the environment looks like. Ooh. So obviously this is gonna look very different within a headset, but that gives you a, a sense of the fact that it's kind of live action using actors. It's a domestic setting. Um, and these were my goals with the, with the project. So, um, specifically to create something, like I've said, that is visceral, not purely cerebral, um, because I'm interested in um, recreating emotions in the body. So where is anxiety? Where is dread? Where is shame? Where is humiliation? And doing that with immersive sound. So sound is really key to the narrative here. Um, the narrative itself is fairly simple. There's not a lot of dialogue, but there will be um, hopefully a very effective use of immersive sound in order to replicate the feeling of emotion in the body and to allow the users to start connecting those feelings with a certain person, a certain situation, etc. Um, and it's really attempting to convey the subtle nature of these kinds of relationships and interactions because it I know that there has been a lot of discussion, which is fantastic about mental abuse recently, but a lot of it is around overt coercive control. Um, and, and what I was interested in looking at is, is phen the phenomena such as gaslighting, passive aggressive behavior in relationships and how that feels because it's quite hard to show, but how does it feel for the, the, the victim of that? Um, and I guess, I'm kind of interested in, very much interested in the in the field of personality psychology and would love to do uh, more within this um, discipline with film because I think there's just a lot of scope um, for creatives to be working within, within psychology. Um, so these are some of my research questions looking at you know, within the kind of PhD. So, um, how can virtual reality um, improve knowledge about and inform treatment of trauma relating to mental abuse? So, so my first kind of stopgap with this pilot 
um, be our experience is actually healthcare training. And, and it was interesting, you know, what Paul was talking about with um, the aspects needed for training and, and retention and, and, you know, using emotion for retention and that sort of thing. Um, so this is, the aim with this one is to, to, to train um, practitioners, so it could be, you know, GPs, I've got various partners involved in the project, BP, uh, GPs, social workers, psychotherapists, obviously. Um, and I think we'll, you know, we'll see how this goes, the pilot goes and see what kind of needs to be tweaked. But ultimately, I'm really interested in therapeutic use of these experiences. So exposure therapy for victims and uh, rehabilitation therapy for uh, perpetrators. And I think one of the interesting questions around this, which we'll probably touch on in a minute, is um, how these things can be effective over time. Um, so, you know, there are there have been some projects with perpetrators of um, physical domestic violence, for example, that measurably changed empathy levels. Um, but what's required to make that a long term um, effect uh, is something that I'm really I'm really interested in. Um, and just to mention future screens. So this pilot was funded by um, future screens, which is a fantastic um, initiative uh, between Queen's and Ulster, which is kind of government funded for the creative industries. Um, and it's such a great time for this to have come along because it's a real bridge between academia and industry, uh, but, but a really meaningful, practical um, bridge that is, that is creating uh, viable projects that will have a real world kind of effect. So, um, so I was really pleased to get the funding from uh, from Future Screens, um, and and I hope that they will be uh, continue to be kind of involved throughout throughout the series that I'm doing. Um, okay, I'm going to stop there um, with my presentations just so we can get into a discussion and take some questions. Okay. So oh, um, I guess there's a lot that we can kind of talk about here, but if we start with thinking about the intersection of the arts and health um, and just the, the, the it's a very broad um, thing that's happening at the moment. I mean, there's lots and lots of different disciplines getting involved, but I'm interested in, in some you know, specific aspects of it, I suppose. Um, and then we, we can just keep talking. Um, so Paul, you were mentioning in, in a kind of training context, um, the uh, making people feel emotion while they're going through your training experience. And is that for you linked to the retention of, of the, the learning? Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely, that, that that's part of it, um, and also retentive learning, but also getting them um, to feel that the, the learning is, is meaningful. What, one of the the main things for us, though, is actually that it's very difficult within a sterile classroom environment um, to um, really get students to uh, make uh, decisions under the same conditions as they would uh, have to in, in practice. Um, so it's quite easy to make a decision when you're in a classroom environment and there's no pressure uh, on you and real life just doesn't work like that. Um, so that's a, a project that myself and Hannah were involved in was really, um, that was one of the core objectives. So can we create an immersive experience where students are put under pressure and asked to make decisions? Uh, and I think that's where part of the emotional uh, aspect of it uh, comes into because you want to feel emotionally invested uh, in the scene and what's going on um, and we want to bring out your sort of values and, and, and empathy within that situation but we also want to see whether that impacts your decision making uh, particularly your professional decision making and that can go two ways it can be uh, feeling pressured uh, by an R scenario a parent to make the decision they want uh, in order to calm the situation down or maybe that you you relate um, a bit too much or overemphasize with the person that you're trying to help and therefore 
you make uh, decisions, you um, maybe go a bit that extra step further. And I don't mean that we shouldn't do that for the people we work with, but I mean that some people then get more favorable outcomes than others um, because you feel more attached to them, which isn't right either in terms of creating a sort of consistency uh, amongst the, sort of your own decision making and the services provided. So yes, emotion and trying to generate emotion plays a, plays a key role for all those, um, all those reasons. Yeah. Um, and um, Hannah and Sarah, I'm just thinking also about one of the most important aspects um, of the partnership with arts and health, apart from the kind of visual aspects of it and the creative aspect is the narrative aspect. So stories, story development. Um, could you both talk a little bit about, about that? Sarah, first, yeah. Uh, sure, well, I guess, yeah, there's, there's, there's kind of two different ways of being able to approach it, right? It's, it's telling stories that can help people, you know, develop their own understanding of the world or or that's like very top down. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about helping people find ways of telling their own stories. And I think that's what's really interesting, and exciting about VR is that you can have these sort of classic narrative approaches, but or you can involve things like game design. And, you know, I guess with the work that I've been doing with Hatsumi, it's it's a more of a participatory tool of looking at like visual storytelling. And again, with like what Hannah's doing with integrating sound as well. And, and I think being able to kind of think about your own story in a very different way and being able to go to these different places and perhaps think about how you can reframe them um, in different ways um, as well. Um, and uh, I think another example of someone that's, that's doing some really interesting work around like VR and storytelling is um, a clinical psychologist over in the US called um, Jessica Stone. And so she created um, an experience called Virtual Sand Tray. So if anyone's familiar with this sort of sand tray based um, approaches, it's almost like a form of play therapy. And she developed it sort of uh, post um, uh, the big tsunami in Japan of realizing there were lots of traumatized kids that needed different forms of, of therapy and through digitizing it, they could actually bring it to people. And so you can create these whole like immersive worlds where um, kids can sort of create these sort of vis visual landscapes as a way of, of talking about their experience. Wow, that sounds amazing. Uh, Hannah? Yeah, no, I just wanted to, I, I, everything what Sarah just said there, it's like, obviously it's really important to have um, sort of a, a creative process where you find different ways of, uh, of allowing people to experience, explore their own stories in artistic ways, in, in, in finding imagery, language, um, and different ways of, of uh, exploring uh, the, their own stories. But another area that I'm really interested in, because a lot of this we have done in theater for, forever and there's so much skill and experience but the, but there is a tweak there is a tweak in how we use the skills that we have and the experiences from other three-dimensional and very closely interactive mediums so I am that's why I'm really fascinated by how do we also bring in artists into this field how do we um, sort of be able to harness all their experience and skill and ideas and creativity as well as allowing um, uh, sort of people to explore and then find their own creativity within a, a situation where they are sort of dealing with something really massive in their own lives. And, and what has been your experience of kind of developing, you know, because it was interesting for us to develop that, the narrative within Mental Abuse Matters. Um, you know, what have you had much experience of developing narratives with medical professionals yet or is that something you will be trying to do is that to me or yes, um, yes. Uh, well in reassemble slightly askew we uh, we sort of had a cons an iterative consultation period uh, or, or several iterations with uh, the um, uh, surgeons, with the um, rehabilitation staff, with the social care staff uh, in around brain uh, damage. So that was one place, uh, obviously, which uh, into the project. The other thing with that project was that we as a creative team 
had to take a decision really early on. We were asked the question by the Wellcome Trust, which was the funder, about the balance between artistic focus and um, an educational focus. And we were sitting there and it was halfway through a process and we were all going, our instincts say, we really want to do this artistically, but we understand that funders have their uh, issues. But we, we sort of stayed with our gut instinct and we, we pushed through in a, um, uh, uh, with our artistic focus. And then we developed the educational package uh, around it on the side. But to be honest, I think it was a completely right decision to take because then going back to all those medical professionals with the final uh, uh, sort of performance, they were absolutely blown away. And, and they said that it really impacted on how they uh, operated uh, near patients. Uh, with brain damage uh, after that and and that's priceless but we you know we we stayed with our skills and our uh, ambitions and vision which was uh, artistic yeah it's, it's an interesting kind of tension there isn't it to see um that that's a, that's an interesting example of it um I would ask the other two but actually we've got to, I'm going to race through on to because we've got so much to kind of cover I wanted to talk to all of you hear from all of you about social prescribing. So um, you've all kind of mentioned it, um, but would you just briefly talk about, you know, your thoughts on it and how it kind of applies to, to your work? So if we go to, to Paul and then Sarah and then Hannah. Um, yeah, no problem. I would just uh, note there, there is a question or two in the, the chat. Um, Lucy, one of them, I'll just answer. There was a question around, uh, about making VR accessible to people with disabilities and uh, we're aware of any projects and stuff that's going on. So um, locally, I know that um, Santa Rail um, have um, designed some VR experiences um, for ASD populations. And also, and that, that would be most of where my knowledge would be at the moment. I also know there's a company called um, New Red who have developed a VR classroom with Nicola Booth, who is our director of our Applied Behavioural Analysis Programme uh, at Queen's, um, looking at um, the use of a virtual classroom uh, to help children with uh, ASD, uh, you know, ad adapt um, and learn new skills within, within that environment. And I also have a PhD student who's going to be looking at a social anxiety and social skills based training um, for ASD populations. There's also some work currently um, being discussed and I'll probably start in the new year with ourselves and colleagues over in Aberystwyth um, University um, that are going to look at um, safeguarding around older vulnerable people um, and use of VR and will probably um, branch out into dementia, uh, I would think. Um, in terms of the other visual impairments, I'm not as aware. It's, it's not um, my area, but I do know that there are uh, there's important research to be done around the acceptability uh, of the, these technologies uh, for people with disabilities. Um, you know, the comfortableness of the technology even around your head. Um, you know, they never take that for granted. Um, you know, it, it it can be strange if you're if you're not used to it. That's why we're, there's such a focus on uh, ASD populations and people who struggle a bit much with. with um, you know, sensory uh, thing. So I don't know if the, the, the rest of the panel is aware of, of research that's ongoing, but that there are the few things uh, that I would be aware of in, in that area. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, anyone else, guys? We can go through any other questions um, just towards the end. Any other thoughts on that? The Parkinson's project, Hannah, maybe worth mentioning that uh, ProPair are developing with my jury as well yeah. um, around um, preventing functional decline. And I know Tracy McConnell is here and is involved in, 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 that, in that project. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Paul, if you could let us know um, what in your experience is being done with, um, with social prescribing at the moment. Um, yeah, well, certainly um, nothing that I'm aware of in relation to, to, to VR um, and stuff, but I, you know, I'm happy to be uh, corrected and uh, directed to um, stuff, that, stuff that is happening. I think social prescribing is, um, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's a, new, a new concept, but it's certainly one that's getting a bit more traction, I think, which is great. 
um, and that sort of um, that concept of trying try an alternative approaches uh, to, to medicine uh, or the medication, I think, is something we need to explore uh, in more detail. One of the barriers in this area will be access to the sort of hardware, but there are, you know, there is an ability to, to turn your phone into a, you know, a very cheap VR viewer. Although some of the conversations I have been, um, I've been, I've been having with some of our local companies were saying that certainly I think Samsung have, are starting to move away um, from from that or putting support or, and are focusing uh, on different types of technologies. I could, I could be wrong on that. Um, so I'm not too sure of the exact state of play for that. But I think one of the big barriers to social prescribing in this field is going to be how do we get the technology in everyone's hand? We're certainly buoyed by the fact that uh, headsets are getting cheaper. I mean, the Oculus Go headset, which was the first kind of portable one, the price of that is dramatically reduced now. I think you can get that for about 120, 130 pound, whether GP surgeries would loan them out as part of a social prescribing. That would be interesting. But there's also other ways that it can be used to social prescribing. I mean, traditionally, like physical activity, I mean, as well, being looked at and researched in the social prescribing field. Um, helping people engage more with nature, as we, we spoke just before uh, the talk, might be interesting. And I wonder, could that be supplemented through the use of virtual reality? I'm thinking of some of the or Immersive 360 videos, some of the imagery that you'd, you'd shown, Hannah, um, you know, as a way of helping people who perhaps can't get out into those nature-based environments and bringing nature in, into the home. Uh, but certainly it's, a, it's an area, particularly in mental health, uh, and certainly there's been some work by... Gavin Davison and colleagues regarding using the creative arts and, and, and arts as, as a form of therapy within the mental health. And I think we really need to be exploring uh, the, those approaches because that medical model, um, you know, we, we need additional options. And I think, um, you know, some of the things that Sarah was chatting about are, are, are very important and, and we need, need, need different and new ways and innovative ways of, of addressing these issues, you know. Um, Sarah, I know you have been working with the uh, so the Mozilla platform the, the, that's kind of multi-use with different headsets and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, can you just talk a bit more about your social prescribing from, from your end? Um, yeah, well, I guess like with the, the way that we've been developing Katsumi, then we're taking a slightly different approach in how we're creating it. So um, so when referencing Mozilla, I guess we're, we're really interested in, in web VR, so virtual reality that's available via the web, just because uh, I'm acutely aware that uh, organisations like Oculus are very risk adverse when it comes to any sort of VR experience that is making some sort of healthcare claims, because that essentially turns them into a medical device. Uh, but obviously, it's one of the most accessible headsets out there. So we're doing like virtual reality that's available via the web, uh, which means that it can sort of be hardware agnostic and can be accessed on a variety of devices, including the Oculus Quest, uh, without actually having to publish by them or kind of deal with things like SideQuest, if anyone's familiar with that, which is kind of being able to sideload same things. Um, but in terms of how I'm really interested in how VR can be applied to social prescribing, um, I guess it's just, it's, I think it's important to make this distinction between like VR that's like a mental health intervention, that's like, you know, we are prescribing this to you that's going to like make you better somehow uh, dealing with whatever you're dealing with and things that are just like really great for your well-being, right? And uh, going to the theatre, great for your well-being, like singing, also excellent, but you don't necessarily need a medical prescription for that. And, uh, and I think it's... Um, becoming a bit of a grey area in, in VR and mental health that you can kind of argue both in some things. Um, but I think being able to uh, create experiences that, that can be helpful for maintaining your, your well-being that, um, that, yeah, aren't necessarily interventions are really important. And even in lockdown, I think like, uh, I, I feel like I, I felt like a bit of a fraud before that I was like talking so much about how much I love VR, but then like hardly ever used it. And then lockdown happened. And I've just been having like the best time, like hanging out with people that I work with and friends, like in virtual reality, being able to have like social, like multi player experiences where we're playing games together and kind of giving your friend a hug from afar when you haven't seen anyone in like three months 
And I think it's like things like that, that we don't need to like overthink or overproduce, but are things that are, are just really vital to our sort of needs as humans. Um, again, like being in real nature is, is already always preferable, but when you're stuck in a hospital because you're deeply unwell, like to be able to go into an experience where you're taken to, you know, a beautiful forest, uh, or if you're elderly and, and you know, you can't, can't go out, then, then those sort of experiences and being able to share that with other people, um, I think it's extraordinarily valuable. Hannah? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I, I think for me, that's why I, one, one reason why I focused on uh, immersive audio, I think a lot of these experiences have to be able to be both facilitated within a, a clinical setting uh, together with the uh, people who can show you how to use them um, and uh, what to what to focus on. But then also, so for me, because my particular one about rehabilitation, so it's about repetition. So I'm trying to find a way for people to be able to uh, do a repetitious sort of exercise experience that they can continue to build on that is not the same every time so and I think that's another thing it's that it, how long you know what is the impact of them if you only do it once versus if you actually build it into uh, uh, something that you develop sort of and continue to use so I think there's lots of issues there around um, uh, sort of the, the technology and making it as easy as possible to revisit um, and making it part of your uh, world, as well as having that kind of clinical interaction and in, in around it as well. Yeah, so that kind of it kind of leads into relationships with healthcare, doesn't it? Because I, I mean, I'm interested in, as well to think about how these you know, more on the kind of intervention side of things so if you are using my experience therapeutically for example um you know the research around uh, how much how often and for what period that would need to be used um uh is, is something i'm really interested in, in looking at and i think to address a lot of these things we do need a formal ongoing relationship um with healthcare, don't we, as, as arts practitioners. Um, and not only at kind of development stage, so, you know, looking at incubators and accelerators for ideas, for prototypes, um, and, and there are lots emerging and, and quite a few out there, like Future Screens, like, like I've mentioned, but there are a lot of kind of creative tech incubator, incubators out there. Um, but also all the way through to um, the kind of rollout and distribution of, of, of products into healthcare. Um, do any of you have any thoughts, Sarah? I know you're working um, with Immerse UK on kind of establishing relationships. So what's the kind of current state of play of the relationships between creative practitioners and healthcare in terms of distribution channels and, and incubators and that sort of thing? Um, I think it's still it's still very fragmented. I think there's a lot lot of work that needs to happen, and, and I don't think it's necessarily going to be organisation. Well, I think it's about all these organisations coming together and really uh, people like NHS that, that have the ability to create that sort of infrastructure. But I think it's exciting seeing um, yeah people like Story Futures Academy that have been creating uh, their immersive mental health fellowships. Um, so this was a, a result of. Um, uh, some research that I did with them a while ago about the role of the arts and creative practice in VR for mental health and I guess we have to acknowledge that we are functioning within um, a very set system um, things like healthcare are, are, are quite rigid in how they work and it's very hierarchical and um, again same often with academia which is, I guess is why I didn't find a home in academia in the end um, and it's just like I guess finding ways to be able to create opportunities for that collaboration in the first place and and um, and I think it's still often like very, very top down, you know, when you apply for funding, then it's, it's got to be led by an academic or a healthcare professional, you've got to have that sort of clinical PI, but even like how it works with sort of those agreements within like how, how, how does the artist benefit from this or what is their contribution. And I know that I've really found challenges in the past of just like trying to find the, the perfect person to work with meeting them talking about what to do refining what to do, then putting together a funding application, and then at the last minute at the sort of IP department from the university comes in and says oh by the way like you, you can't really like own any of this or, or, or 
or you know it's it's, it's also the the sort of underpinning bits about what that relationship means going forward and so that's how this um, program with story future started was if a startup has an idea and wants to be able to clinically validate it, then we will match you with a psychologist from Royal Holloway and you can design it together. You know exactly what you're in for. You write one application and then you can work together and continue to work together as well. And I think it's it's just starting with like how, how you even find those people to work with, but also what that looks like going forward. Um, because also we're looking at, you know, what's the difference between creating a, a research project that you want to publish on uh, or, you know, being a startup where perhaps you want to like find a way of creating a, a sort of sustainable um, product, I guess. And there's just, yeah, there's a lot to consider, but I think it's really important to think about um, sustainability of this and, and how and when artists are brought in and realizing that they're not the person that just makes it pretty and shiny at the last minute, but really embedding them in the experience and, and having that, um, you know, sort of ownership and feeling like they have a, a significant role in the development. Okay, thank you. I know you've got to rush off, um, Sarah. So um, thank you very much for your contribution. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, we, yeah, we are kind of running over by quite a bit, so we will sort of finish up, but just to ask um, the other two, you know, what are your thoughts on the relationships, the existing relationships or how that might be facilitated a bit more? Um, yeah, I, I mean, what Sarah was saying is, is um, it's interesting. That that's a lot of the reason why I started the network. Um, I mean, the academic, I suppose, side of that is that <clears throat> we can't create any of um, these products without input from um, from other people. I mean, the skills and the knowledge just doesn't exist uh, within our school uh, to, to do this. Um, so we have to reach out. And, and one of the great things then about collaboration is about this exposure to new ideas and new ways of working and developing a more transdisciplinary approach um, to the way we work where you learn as you go. Um, it's not that you bring people in uh, to do bits of work and then they leave, but it's very much a collaborative process where they kind of teach you a bit about their process and then you understand uh, through that engagement. Um, so that the next time when you collaborate, things go a bit smoother because you have a good appreciation of, of what's going on. But as Sarah said, it, it, is, it is fragmented, um, but there's a lot of good opportunities locally. Future Screens and I is a great example um, of bringing uh, sort of industry and academia together. Uh, and it's industry-led, uh, so we tend to be the kind of minor uh, partner. And I mean that for more the sense of the onus is on the, the company to, to go in and, and lead that. Uh, application where for researchers there definitely is more of the, the, the academic lead and the companies kind of tagged on. What, what we felt was that, and certainly for our experiences, it was a very transactional relationship that we would have had with external companies. Do you know, um, we have an idea for a product that we want developed, whatever that might be, an app, a website, and we'd kind of sort of, this is how much money it is, and, uh, and then that's where the relationship goes. And the tension kind of arisen when you wanted to change it or modify it because, well, that costs more money. And I think there's probably fault on both sides there and our sides because we just assume that there's flexibility or because we don't know the field. So we can't future plan exactly what we need and things need to develop. Uh, so we always felt that it was it was just about the plus there's like a there's a there's a reason that we're doing there's a meaning behind it. You know, it's for good. And uh, our companies are very much you know, hiring us to do a job. So I, I like the way it's evolving now, um, where it's more of a collaborative process, uh, where companies will come in preferably at the start um, and take a bit of ownership and work from the ground up and develop something together, whereby we're conscious of their needs and how they need to develop some, you know, uh, products for the commercial world. Uh, but they're also sensitive to what we need and that our, you know, our, um, not that we move the goalposts, but our, our needs might shift depending on new research that's emerging uh, that we might, or new ideas that we might have about the best ways of doing things. So yeah, yeah getting better. Um, okay. Um, Hannah, just your final thoughts. I don't think anybody, if anybody has any final questions, do put them in the chat before we finish up. Um, just my final thoughts, coming from an artistic background, not uh, having uh, been involved in academia before doing the PhD or uh, very much with um, um, sort of a lot of these um, 
agencies that we've been talking about. So I felt that uh, uh, I had to sort of create something. I had an I had an idea, um, uh, not based on anything but personal experience and my uh, with Parkinson's and and with my own uh, and and then bringing that together with my experience in the theatre and in immersive audio. Uh, so I felt that I had to just jump in. I had to create something which I could then take to people who could talk about uh, evaluation and talk about how, you know, how maybe it will sit within a bigger system. But I'm still in that process of uh, uh, developing lots of different ideas around how to put it together, which is very pleasurable, but I am, uh, but I feel a little bit sort of unsure about the rest of it, the, the next part of the journey. Yeah, but excited. I think a lot of a lot of us feel the same, but um, but there's but there's lots happening. Okay, thank you very much, guys. We're going to finish up there, um, and uh, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks.